All right, so the first type of parasite that I'm going to talk about is sort of a, a neato kind of parasite. They're commonly found in uh, on the gills of fishes. And I like talking about this group of parasites because uh, it is one of the few really good examples of monogamy in the animal world. So people get all, like, doughy-eyed when they think about swans and how they're monogamous. And, you know, there are lots of different bird species that we think of as monogamous. And we think it's really sweet and it goes on our greeting cards, blah, blah, blah. But quite often when we run paternity tests, we'll find that a lot of the eggs come from different daddies. So the moms and the dads are sort of sneaking around behind each other's backs. And it doesn't look like it outwardly, but the offspring are telling the story, uh, or the genes of the offspring are telling the story, and these, these guys are cheating. Uh, but the di in the diplazoons, there is no cheating. There is true monogamy. So in this picture, there are two different individuals that are completely fused to one another. Uh, and they make sort of an X shape, and if you were to split the X vertically down the center, you'd be able to get the two different individuals, so they each have sort of uh, a brown section and a white section. And these guys start off as juveniles that are called diporpas. And in fact, we thought these were their own species because they look very different from the adults and you always find them separately. But uh, it's the case that these diporpas cannot mature into... Oh, sorry. So now we call the juvenile stage diporpas. Uh, we repurpose that word. So these diporpas cannot reach sexual maturity until they find a partner. So they always look different than the adults because they're moving around and they're not sexually mature yet. So when they find... When two diporpas find each other... They fuse together, and they literally fuse together so you cannot pull them apart. They mature, and their reproductive organs open into one another so that they can fertilize. And if you were to yank them apart, you would essentially be just destroying them because they are now one, one individual. So uh, in my opinion, these parasites, these diplozoons, should really be what's on greeting cards. If you want to tell someone that you want to be with them forever, you should give them a card with some diplozoon parasites on it. Uh, so anyway... Monogamy in the parasite world. Makes your heart go pitter-patter. So uh, Dactylogyrus is the first group of, or genus of parasites that I'll be talking about that tends to be important for economic purposes because uh, they can give you, you can have problems, Dactylogyrus Dactyl problems uh, with your fish or with hatchery fish. So what these parasites do is they typically infect gills, but not always, but commonly they do. Uh, and they'll chew on the gills and... Uh, the gills will get really irritated and they'll produce a lot of mucus because of this irritation. And so the gills will essentially get coated with this mucus to the point where the fish can have a whole lot of trouble breathing because, as you probably know, the gills are the surface across which oxygen diffuses so that the fish can get oxygen and can essentially breathe. And so if you cover up this surface, then they can no longer get oxygen and they can't breathe. And so you'll see fish sort of lifting up their operculum, which is the flap that covers the gills, and they'll try to scratch their gills against hard surfaces to get these parasites off. Uh, and if that doesn't work and the parasite infection builds up to high densities, sometimes you'll see these fish gasping for air at the surface of the water. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it means that they are, uh, they're suffocating because their, their infection is covering up all of their gills. So these parasites produce eggs that fall to the bottom of the water, and depending on the water temperature, it'll take a couple days for these eggs to hatch. Uh, and then they'll produce a sweet free swimming form that will try to uh, find its next host. Uh, the cycle for these parasites usually ends up being uh, at the beginning of the summer, you have a, a few adults infecting. And over the course of the summer, you end up with bigger and bigger infections. But as the temperature starts to drop, the adults start to die. Uh, but their eggs are really resistant to cold temperatures. And so instead of hatching, at a certain temperature, the eggs will begin to lay dormant until temperatures warm up again. And so you'll end up with a big burst of infection in the spring when the temperatures warm up and the eggs finish development and start hatching. And that big uh, increase or influx of parasites into the population coincides with when these fish are having uh, babies and there are young of the year around. And so the parasites manage to uh, infect all of the new fish. So you end up with these fluctuations in infection uh, throughout, the, throughout the year that's matched with temperature. Uh, and these are common parasites of koi, which, par which people will spend a lot of money on uh, and get quite upset when their koi end up dying. So the next group of parasites are the gyrodactylids, and these are uh, referred to sometimes as the Russian doll parasites. So uh, if you're familiar with Russian dolls, there are those dolls where like there's a big one on top and you open the lid and there's an exactly there's the exact same one but smaller is inside of that and you keep going until you get you know one really small individual in the center. Uh, and these parasites do something similar, which is really awesome. So uh, if you look at the picture, 
uh, you can see that there's an adult. So on the left is uh, a drawing of uh, the actual individual on the right. And within the first individual, you can see a set of hooks, labeled hooks of first embryo. And those hooks are the first generation embryo of this adult. And inside of that, you can see tiny hooks forming for a second generation embryo. So essentially, one adult can give birth to a mini adult who is already pregnant uh, and is producing, is growing up its second embryo. So the first offspring will spend about a day eating or something, and that embryo will finish developing, and it will give birth to that embryo like a day or so later. And that only then can it start fertilizing its own eggs and uh, producing its own embryos. So you essentially get these, these Russian doll parasites that are carrying multiple generations of parasites within them, which means that they're able to reach high densities in a really short amount of time, which makes them a really big problem. And so interestingly, this begs the question, are these parasites or pathogens? So if you remember to one of the introductory lectures, I told you that pathogens are organisms that produce offspring that stay on the host, uh, as, and parasites are uh, organisms that produce offspring that go off in search of new hosts. So uh, these parasites fit the definition of a pathogen more than they do fit the definition of a parasite. And you might be thinking, oh, well, what difference does that make? This is all just science jargon. But it matters to the organism that's infected, and it matters to how you choose to treat it. So if you are infected with a dactylogyrus parasite, if you're a fish infected with a dactylogyrus parasite, and you're only infected by one, well, it's not really a big deal. Its offspring aren't going to stay on you, and as long as you can avoid the offspring that are swimming around after the eggs hatch, then you'll probably be fine. But if you're infected by one dactylogyrus parasite, this thing's going to keep reproducing on you and producing more and more offspring. And so now if the fish doesn't mount a good immune response or find some way to get rid of these parasites, then it's in a lot of trouble. So the implications for the host are much different, uh, whether or not you call it a parasite or a pathogen. Uh, and so dactylogyrus parasites are not actually parasites, they're really pathogens. So uh, what happens to infected fish? What's the pathology? So uh, these parasites are anchoring on, and then the other end that's not an anchor is feeding, and it's feeding on mucus and on skin, um, and so once it removes the mucus, the mucus is a protective layer to protect the fish from bacteria and fungus, so this mucus, when it gets removed and you get a little bit of an open wound, you can get these secondary bacterial infections that can be quite dangerous. Uh, you also get uh, what's called clamped fins, so if you look at the picture on the right, the caudal fin, which is the fin on the back of the fish, is really pointy, whereas usually it's sort of fanned out. And when you have infections, uh, the fins of the fish will tend to sort of clamp together and get stuck, which makes it sort of hard for the fish to move around. Uh, and this is called clamped fins. Uh, you can get redness or cloudy patches in the areas where uh, the monogenes are eating because that area gets irritated and uh, could get an infection. And there are some monogenes that are even able to uh, burrow themselves down to where they can get access to the blood and they'll start sucking on the blood of the fish. Uh, and this can cause the fish to become anemic. Uh, so let's think back to the gyrodactylus parasites for a minute. So if you have parasites that don't have a free swimming phase, you just have these little adults, uh, then how do you get the parasites from one host to another if they're you know, that the host that they're living on isn't going to live forever. So at some point, that individual needs to get its offspring to another host. Otherwise, uh, you know, its lineage is a goner. So the way that you transfer gyrodactylid parasites between one another is by getting individuals in very close contact or getting them to touch, which can happen either by mating or by living in a social group. And so fishes will sometimes live in shoals of large individuals. And if they get close enough, then they can quickly pass the gyrodactylid parasites between one another. Uh, and Richards et al. in 2010 took guppies and split them into same-sex groups. And so I'll tell you a little bit about guppies real quick. Uh, so guppies are fishes that will produce live offspring. So at the top of the picture, there's a male. And the male's uh, fin at the... Sorry, one of the male's fins is modified into a gonadopodium, which it will actually use to deliver sperm into the female. So there's internal fertilization, and the female will give birth to live young. So the males will compete over females, which means that they don't really, uh, quote unquote, like to spend a lot of time with one another. And so they don't tend to spend a lot of time in uh, same-sex groups because they're competitors. Whereas the females 
aren't competing with one another for the males, and so they will live in same-sex groups to get the benefits of living in a shoal, which is uh, dilution of predator risk, more eyes looking for food, uh, and maybe even more eyes to keep track of where these males are, because the males will sometimes do sneak matings, and if a female's not paying attention, they'll uh, try to fertilize her, which is a jerk thing to do. So anyway, uh, they will... What they did in this paper was they separated female, females into all female groups and males into all male groups, and they infected one individual in each shoal and looked at uh, how that, it looked at how many other individuals in the shoal ended up getting infected. And what they found was that females were more frequently encountering one another, which is perhaps not surprising given that we know they spend more time in shoals, uh, and they were spending more time with one another. Whereas the males were encountering each other less frequently, and when they did encounter one another, they were spending less time with one another. Uh, what they found was that females had a four times greater risk of getting this par the gyrodactylid parasite. Uh, I think it was gyrodactylus turnbulli. Uh, they had a four times greater risk four times greater risk of getting the parasite uh, than did the males because they were spending more time in contact with the females. So this has important implications uh, in the animal world, but imp also important implications for us and important economic implications because we force fish to essentially be social and touch one another when we put them in hatcheries at high densities. So at in hatchery conditions, uh, gyrodactylus parasites get passed between one another very quickly and you can get infections building up in most or all of the population in a very short period of time because gyrodactylid parasites are so good at reproducing quickly.